welcome to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, your weekly dose of the top pro-life news and issues, all from a Catholic perspective. I am your host, Catherine Hadro, in our Washington, D.C. studio. Thank you for joining us. In this week's show, there was another horrific discovery involving the late abortionist Ulrich Klopfer. We have more with Indiana Representative Jackie Walorski. A UK woman with disabilities will get forced contraception. We speak out. And this. I mean, the people we're speaking about are super young. They're not, they're not even one day old yet. A 13-year-old stands up for life in the face of bullying. But first, our top story, a federal appeals court has put on hold an Ohio law banning abortions solely based on a Down syndrome diagnosis. The 2-1 ruling claims the Ohio law is likely unconstitutional. Under the Ohio law, abortionists would be charged with a fourth-degree felony, stripped of their medical license, and held liable for legal damages if they commit an abortion on a baby with a prenatal diagnosis indicating Down syndrome. A 2012 study found 61 to 93 percent of babies diagnosed with Down syndrome in the womb were aborted in the United States. Down syndrome is a genetic condition in which there is an extra chromosome. It can cause both physical and mental challenges. Last week's federal appeals court ruling comes in the midst of Down Syndrome Awareness Month. We speak now with a member of Congress who has personally experienced the gift an extra chromosome can bring. Representative Pete Stauber of Minnesota joins us from Capitol Hill. Congressman, thank you for your time. Thank you very much for having me, Catherine. Absolutely. Congressman, first off, as we recognize Down Syndrome Awareness Month, tell us about your son, Isaac. So uh, my wife and I are, are blessed to have a, a, a child with Down Syndrome. Our Isaac uh, is 17 years old, and, and he, he was an un unexpected blessing in our lives. And, and my wife and I were blessed with a total of four children. Uh, uh, the boys are 19, 18, and 17. Isaac's our 17-year-old boy. And then we have a 13-year-old daughter. So Isaac is right in between uh, my daughter and the boys. And uh, like I say, uh, when Isaac was born, uh, just an extreme blessing on our family. And uh, he's just enriched our family and our extended family as well. That is beautiful to hear. And Congressman, a federal appeals court last week put on hold the Ohio law that bans abortions specifically because of a Down syndrome diagnosis. What do you make of the significance of laws like that one in Ohio? Well, Catherine, I think that um, I can talk and my wife can talk with personal experience the blessing our special needs children are. Uh, our Isaac with Down, Down syndrome, he's, he brings such a, uh, um, such a, a grace and beauty and love and happiness and stubbornness to our family. And uh, so, so I think that people, once they understand, uh, um, when we talk about our special needs population, you know, sometimes we, we talk about their disability. We want to look at their ability. What abilities do they have? And they have so many abilities and they have their time and their treasure and their talents to give our communities in this nation. People that, um, you know, want to uh, uh, have abortions because of uh, a, a prenatal test uh, with a diagnosis uh, such as Down syndrome. It, for me and my wife, we just want to pray for them and, and let them know that they are, it, it's such a blessing. And, and in some respects, it's a God's choosing. God chose those mom and dads uh, to be the parents for that uh, special needs children. To that point, your former colleague, former U.S. Representative Sean Duffy, recently stepped away from his role in Congress to spend more time with his family as he and his wife recently just welcomed their ninth child, a baby girl with Down syndrome. Congressman Stauber, do you have any parenting advice or insight you want to share with that your former colleague on what to expect in raising a child with Down syndrome? I, I can't wait to uh, have a conversation with uh, Congressman Duffy and his wife, uh, Rachel, about the blessings they, they not only that have been bestowed upon them, but the blessings yet to come. Um, I was just telling a coworker of mine that our Isaac, 17 years old, he just had his graduation pictures uh, taken. and. Uh, 
uh, the cat's out of the bag now, but my wife and I are going to be sending uh, Congressman Duffy and his wife a picture of our uh, son Isaac uh, and his graduation picture. So uh, they, have, they have wonderful experiences ahead. Uh, it's going to bring them closer together as a family and really closer to, uh, closer to God. Finally, Congressman, has your son Isaac's life influenced your decision to be pro-life? Oh, even before uh, we were blessed uh, with, uh, with our Isaac, um, I, I have always been a pro-life individual. Um, I believe life begins at conception and ends at natural death. And uh, I, I believe that uh, for as long as I can uh, remember, um, life is precious. Um, being a police officer for 23 years, I've seen life taken uh, away uh, by violence and drugs. And, and uh, I, I just, uh, I can't tell you how important it is that we realize that life is precious every day, that the good Lord gives us the opportunity to, you know, uh, spend with our family and friends and, and, and even uh, work in Congress to better our nation. It's just such a blessing. Representative Pete Stauber of Minnesota, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure being with you. Have a good day. And joining us now in our D.C. studio is Autumn Christensen, the policy director for the Susan B. Anthony List. Autumn, welcome back. Thank you. You know, this month we really want to honor our brother and sisters with Down syndrome in a special way because October is Down Syndrome Awareness Month. So why is it important that we hear from families like Representative Stalbers and others who are actually gifted with a child with Down syndrome? Well, I just thought it was so special to hear Congressman Stauber talk about the importance of recognizing the abilities of kids and individuals who have Down syndrome. And what a testament to the hundreds of thousands of Americans who have Down syndrome. I think about Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers, Congressman Duffy, Congressman Stauber, their willingness to give testimony to the value of those lives and to fight back against the myth that uh, the lives are of children who have Down syndrome are not worthy of taking their first breath is just so special and no better time to do that than this month. Absolutely, and yet, Autumn, last week an appeals court blocked Ohio from enforcing a law that prevents abortions solely because of a Down syndrome <coughs> diagnosis. Ohio will now ask the Sixth Circuit to review that case, but what should our viewers know about this Ohio law and similar laws? Sure. You know, 67% of children diagnosed with Down syndrome in the womb are aborted. 67%, that's two-thirds of little babies with Down syndrome who are aborted. And the legislators in the state of Ohio looked at that statistic and they said, we're not going to allow that in our state. We are going to create a safe haven here in our state for these children to be respected and loved and protected. And such a courageous action. Of course, we're disappointed with the decision um, by, the, by the courts, but we certainly hope that the Supreme Court will take a closer look at this mm -hmm. and that laws like it will be upheld. As a pro-life policy director yourself, would you advise other states to also take on laws that ban these Down syndrome discrimination abortions? Absolutely. You know, one of the most um, interesting statistics is that 99% of individuals who have Down syndrome are happy with their life, mm -hmm. and 99% of their parents love them dearly. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think that that statistic comes as a surprise, but it certainly would seem surprising when you turn over and look at those clinics where moms and dads are given a diagnosis of Down syndrome, and the immediate question is, do you want to, quote unquote, terminate? terminate? Mm -hmm. um, and really, what better way to combat that message of termination than to say, we value these children and in our state? The answer is going to be, let me tell you about how uh, valuable these kids lives are, how much their parents love them, how happy they are, they are, and let's provide love and support rather than offering the option of abortion. Finally, Autumn, earlier this year the Supreme Court declined to rule on a similar law in Indiana, but in his concurring opinion, Justice Clarence Thomas wrote that states have, quote, compelling interest in preventing abortion from becoming a tool of modern-day eugenics. Can you expand on what the justice is getting at here? Yeah, you know, um, he makes this very compelling point that discriminatory abortions are truly modern-day eugenics. 
and calls it out for what it is, which is very um, important to remember. And then the other thing that's important in that decision is that the court did leave the door open to further considering laws like this. They are looking for more circuit courts to weigh in. They want the courts to look at the issue more deeply at the lower level, but we are certainly hopeful that the Supreme Court will take up a case to protect children with Down syndrome in the womb. Thank you, as always, for your expertise. Autumn Christensen, Policy Director for the Susan B. Anthony List. Thank you. Thank you. There is less than a month until another open season for the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, begins. But before that, we need the Trump administration to take urgent action, because currently insurance companies are permitted to collect an abortion surcharge in a single payment, instead of collecting it separately. This is a misinterpretation of the law put into place during the Obama administration and means the abortion surcharge is hidden. So pro-life consumers might pay for this coverage without their knowledge. Fortunately, last year, an official in the Trump administration proposed a new rule change which would correct the interpretation of the law regarding the abortion surcharge. But that vital rule change has yet to be finalized. Less than a month from the next Obamacare open season, which brings us to this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com where you can send an email directly to the Trump administration to say, please promptly finalize this pro-life rule. Again, there is less than one month to go until Obamacare's open season, so the Trump administration needs to act quickly to finalize this rule to ensure pro-life Americans are no longer tricked into paying for abortion in their health care plans. Congress has failed to approve legislation to remove abortion from Obamacare, so we need the Trump administration to take action. Here's how you can help. You can send your email message directly to the Trump administration by going to ProLifeWeekly.com. Again, that is ProLifeWeekly.com to tell them to promptly finalize this pro-life rule. Turning now to our next story, Indiana's attorney general announced 165 sets of baby remains have been found inside a car owned by recently deceased abortionist Ulrich Klopfer bringing the total number of preserved baby remains discovered at his properties to more than 2,400. This latest news comes nearly one month after authorities first discovered baby remains on Klopfer's Illinois property. The Will County Sheriff's Office discovered the additional remains while searching Klopfer's Mercedes-Benz as part of their ongoing investigation. Those remains are believed to be from abortions Klopfer committed in 2002 at his three Indiana abortion facilities. He was known to be Indiana's most prolific abortionist. To discuss this ongoing case, we spoke recently with Indiana Representative Jackie Walorski, who is calling for a federal investigation into Klopfer. Here is our interview. Representative Jackie Walorski joins us now from Indianapolis, Indiana. Congresswoman, thank you for your time. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. First off, what was your reaction upon the horrendous discovery at Ulrich Klopfer's home? I was horrified. I think it's disgusting, but I wasn't the least bit surprised. This guy has been around performing thousands of abortions in the state of Indiana, even when I was back at the Indiana State House, so I was very familiar with him. I thought it was heinous, and more than anything else, I wanted to get to the bottom of it, call for an investigation, and make sure it never happens again. And I wish he hadn't died a month ago. I wish I could see the day that he actually went to prison. For those of us not from Indiana, what should we know about Ulrich Klopfer's time as an abortionist in South Bend and violations involving his clinic? You know, this guy is notorious. For years, he performed what we would call chop-chop abortions, leaving women um, disfigured, uh, women dying. Um, just horrendous things that happened in our state. And I, I began the search after him when I was in the Indiana State House. And he would come in with, you know, we tried to take his admitting, admitting privileges away in the state of Indiana. We tried to make sure he stayed licensed. We tried, to, we, we tried major oversight on him to make sure for the dignity of the women and the child that was involved that we could do everything we could do legally and, and do what we could do to, to put him out of business as well. So I wasn't surprised when 
they found these 2,200 bottles with formaldehyde and baby parts and baby fetuses in them, I just wasn't surprised. You know, he was a heinous operator. That's one of the reasons why folks like me that are in government want to make sure that we can provide as much oversight on the abortion industry and these abortion doctors as possible, because who would do that? Who would do what he did? Who would have 2,200 bottles on shelves in his house only discoverable by his family upon his death. And I just think it's horrendous. I think that oversight needs to be involved and I'm gonna pursue it at the federal level and I'm sure my colleagues in the state of Indiana are as well. Vice President Mike Pence, who also hails from Indiana, calls for a full and thorough investigation. Is there any further action you'd like to see from the White House on this? Well, we're already at, at the uh, legislative level bringing down bills. Our senators just brought down a bill that they'll move through the Senate, I'll carry it in the House. And it basically is kind of what Indiana's law is. It basically says that, you know, any abortion that's performed, including chemical, which is really important, that there has to be a tracker in a, in a uh, disposition with dignity, either cremated or buried. And the reason that's important is because here we are today, after all this news, in uh, the city of South Bend, which is a rather infamous city at the moment, there's a chemical abortion facility that's illegal that's running and operating there. And I want to make sure that when we get this law passed, that they as well need to be responsible for what they do with the body parts of a chemical abortion. And they're actually operating illegal today, even despite all the news of Klopfer as a bad operator. And Congresswoman, I want to dig a little bit more into that. As you mentioned, you have urged your state's attorney general to ensure these baby remains were handled with dignity. And U.S. Senator Mike Braun, your fellow Indianan, recently introduced the Dignity for Aborted Children's Act to require respectful disposition of the remains of unborn children. Can you speak right. to that and, and speak to why it is so important to treat these babies with such dignity? Yeah, because here's the first question, right? The first question is, what in the world was he doing with these? Was he selling them? Like the big investigation we had a couple of years ago to set this nation on its heels to say they're actually selling baby parts in this country? Was he part of that? Did these babies come from Indiana? Which ones came from where? Why in the world was he going to do with those? Why in the world was he saving those? Those are some of the questions that I think are key. Those are some of the questions I think Americans, whether they're pro-life or pro-choice, want to know. This is beyond beyond. This is beyond description. And normal people don't do this. But this abortion doctor with 2,200 of them had a very easy time evidently getting these babies across state lines from different states, a lot of them from the state of Indiana, and now they've been sent right back to Indiana under, under the watchful eye of Indiana Attorney General. There are more questions than answers at this point. And finally, Congresswoman, South Bend Mayor and Democratic presidential candidate Pete Buttigieg also said this matter should be fully investigated. And then he followed it up with this. Take a listen. I also hope that it doesn't get caught up in politics at a time when women need access to health care. What is your response to Mayor Buttigieg saying he hopes this doesn't get too political? Well, I can assure you it hasn't. And I can assure you that for Hoosiers in the state of Indiana, as well in my district in, in northern Indiana, in South Bend, this is common sense. There's nothing political about this. This is a common sense distortion. It's a heinous operator of abortions. And all we're trying to do is to make sure in a very common sense way that we get to the bottom of this and make sure it never happens again. And we have a facility, like I said earlier, we have a facility in the city of South Bend right now that's operating illegally with chemical abortions. And we're on that one as well, trying to make sure that they follow the law or they leave the facility. Representative Jackie Walorski of Indiana, thank you for your pro-life leadership. Thank you so much for the invitation. When we come back, everyone should have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, so should those babies. We introduce you to Addison Woosley, a 13-year-old girl who took a bold stand for life. Stay tuned as EWTM Pro-Life Weekly continues after this break. Welcome back to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm your host, Katherine Hadro. 
a UK woman with severe disabilities who barely avoided having an abortion forced on her will now instead be forced to receive a contraceptive implant. That is this week's Speak Out segment. A judge in England recently decided the pregnant woman will be fitted with a contraceptive device immediately following her C-section. This is the same unidentified woman with a developmental disorder who was ordered to undergo an abortion at 22 weeks pregnant. And while that ruling was fortunately overturned by the Court of Appeal this summer, the latest reports indicate plans to fit her with a contraceptive device will move forward. The circumstances surrounding how this woman became pregnant are under investigation. Even though we don't know this woman's name nor a lot of specifics surrounding her case, she is still a woman with immeasurable dignity. Even though this woman has moderate learning disabilities, she is still a woman with immeasurable dignity. So praise God this woman no longer has a court-ordered abortion, but being forced with a contraceptive device is still an attack, not only on her body, but on her dignity as well. We do know the woman at the center of this case is Catholic, and the Catholic Church teaches contraceptives are intrinsically evil, but the court seems to have no regard for this woman's beliefs. And we know contraceptive devices can leave permanent negative effects on a woman's body, but the court seems to also have no regard for her health nor well-being. It was abuse that led to this woman with disabilities to become pregnant, and this court's latest ruling is further abuse as well. Remember, there is something you can do to counter today's culture of death. Follow this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com to send an email to the Trump administration to finalize the pro-life rule requiring the separate collection of the abortion surcharge and Obamacare plans. It takes courage to stand up in the face of opposition, especially when you're standing up for life and especially when you're one of the youngest in the room. If you think abortion should be illegal, would you please stand up? We need to change the law to change the... Order, 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 order. If you think abortion should be illegal, would you please stand up? We need to change the law to change the world, so let's stand up and do it. Thank you. Order. Inappropriate. Or Everyone, y'all, please, please. S sir, er please. That was 13-year-old Addison Woosley in June of this year addressing her Raleigh, North Carolina City Council. Woosley was listing reasons why Raleigh should be a sanctuary city for the unborn and the importance of protecting life. When adults in the crowd began jeering and yelling and mocking her, the yelling only escalated when Woosley compared abortion to slavery. But Woosley continued to speak and complete her pro-life remarks. We sat down with the young pro-lifer to hear what it was like when that moment went viral and why she continued to speak up for life when the crowd wanted her silent. Addison Woosley, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. You spoke before your city council earlier this year. What was your message to them? Overall, it was asking the city council to make Raleigh a sanctuary city for the unborn, and specifically, it was about how science proves that a preborn baby is a person and that abortion is murder, and then I compared slavery and abortion. Wow. And during your speech, there were some adults in the room that were starting to mock and yell at you as you were speaking. What was going through your mind as that was happening? I was just a little confused because the month before I had gone to hear my friend speak and it was the complete opposite reaction. Everyone was just bored and seemed like they couldn't have cared less. So I never thought about them getting mad. So it's just like, what's going on? But I just tried to get as loud as I could. For critics who may have said, there's no way you wrote that speech on your own. Your parents must have put you up to that. There's just no way. What's the truth? What do you want to say to them? Um, well, I did research and write it. I've always liked reading books about history and writing's my favorite subject, so I think that kind of helped me. You're 13 years old. Do you think someone could ever be too young to speak up for life? Definitely not. I mean, the people we're speaking about are super young. They're not, they're not even one day old yet. So it's really important to have everyone, and it reminds me of the verse in 1 Timothy where it says, don't let anyone despise you for your youth. And so that's cool. And we live in a country where 
um, the First Amendment, like anyone of any age can speak up for their beliefs. So we should all proclaim the truth because anyone can do that. It's really beautiful. Is there anything you want to say uh, to those adults who were yelling at you and mocking you during your city council speech? I would want to tell them the good news of the gospel, that Jesus died for our sins where we should have died because we're big time sinners. And he rose again and whoever believes and follows him will have eternal life. And I want them to know in my paper, I was saying that I hate slavery and all that, and I hate abortion. They're both very terrible. You listed in your speech a number of reasons why someone should be pro-life. Why, Addison, are you pro-life? Well, God creates life in his image, and life matters to him, so it should matter to us. And life, like the words our country are based off from our founding fathers, that everyone should have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, so should those babies, and life is precious, and it should matter, and we should protect their life. You're a devout Christian. How is your prayer life involved in your pro-life beliefs? Well, prayer is powerful, and I just pray a lot for these babies. That's one thing everyone should do. We should be praying that the doctors, abortionists, would come to see that this is murder and it's wrong, for the moms to know there's other options, and just for other believers and pro-life people to step up and be courageous and tell the truth. I remember when I first learned about abortion when I was really little, I was just praying to God saying, this is terrible. If there's anything I can do to stop this, just show me how. I think he's doing that right now. And finally, Addison, if we have a young viewer who's watching and they're pro-life, but they're afraid to speak up for their views. Maybe they're afraid they'll be mocked like you were. What do you want to say to them? I would just say try to take the focus off of you and put it on the babies that are being brutally butchered and viciously torn from limb to limb. They're the ones who would be afraid. And we need to be courageous and strong and stand up and speak the truth so that people can know that this should be illegal and we need to stop this. Addison Woosley, thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you. How sweet is she, 13 years old, and she's my hero. Finally, I have an update I want to share with you. You will see a different face in this chair for the next few weeks. I will be back soon. I'm just taking some personal time away to prepare for the pro-life battle that promises to be intense at the beginning of next year. I have no doubt that our team and guest hosts will keep you well informed in the meantime. You will see EWTN's own Debbie Cowden, EWTN News' senior contributor, Dr. Gracie Christie, and other guest hosts. These intelligent Catholic women will do a great job in the guest host chair while I'm away. But I'm looking forward to being back with you soon because honestly, I cannot wait for 2020. Between the U.S. presidential election, an upcoming Supreme Court ruling on abortion, and even a new, fresh look for the show, we have a lot of top pro-life coverage planned for you next year. Until then, I'll be keeping you in my prayers and I hope you'll do the same. And as always, remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.